Okay, we're back live here at uh, Strata Conference uh, in Silicon Valley where the big data discussion's happening uh, all around us. Uh, this, uh, the world's changing, the business intelligence data warehouse market's changing and all new technologies are, are here uh, making it happen. So uh, I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com and I'm here with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org and we're here with Billy Bosworth who's the CEO of Datastax. Uh, Billy, first time Q, but a fan, I understand, so Big welcome. Big fan, yeah, watched uh, you guys many times. It's <laughs> real thrilled to be on. You guys right, were well. on last year too at the Cube. We had um, your other guy on who left right. Datastax to start uh, pl uh, pl pl Plafora. Plafora, which yeah. is uh, uh, early, early stage company. I think they got a Series A from a uh, uh, big VC firm in, uh, right. somewhere in Silicon Valley. I never heard of it before. Um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> we, uh, they only uh, have a six billion, yeah. four billion dollars in the management. Small fund. <laughs> yeah, small yeah. fund. Yeah. So, so Bill, you guys I invented the Netscape browser. That's right. You know who they are. So you guys come. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into it. So you guys commercialize uh, Apache Cassandra, right? Um, talk a little bit about that, um, where you fit in this whole ecosystem. Great. Well, so Apache Cassandra is obviously very near and dear to us. It's what we started the company on. Um, the founders uh, were responding to a demand of people who were moving into production environments with Cassandra and needed help with that. And that was the early stages of it. Since that time, we've evolved our business model a great deal. And the situation now is that we want to absolutely see uh, Cassandra thrive and grow in the community. So we do a lot with that. We um, are obviously behind a lot of the commits that go into it. We help with the education process. Uh, we have a free version of it that we bundle with uh, documentation, tutorials, that sort of thing. But then we also leverage it as a core foundational technology to a larger offering called Datastax Enterprise. And the interesting thing about what we're doing there is we do not fork the code. and so. When you're in open source world and you use a word like commercialize, all the open Whoa. source all the open source uh, ears go up, right? Uh, like, what's that mean? Are you forking it? We don't do that. That's not our philosophy. So our philosophy is we leverage Cassandra to do interesting stuff for enterprises in a big data platform. So does 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 DSE replace HDFS? Is it? It does not use HDFS. That's correct. It okay. uses the Cassandra technology, which is a fully distributed architecture versus a master slave architecture. So there's there's really you pick one or the other when you're doing these type of systems. And so with us it's about you bring the data in via Cassandra and then you don't want to move it around. So we enable people to leave it where it is and then do Hadoop functionality on top of it. But the key thing there it becomes your workload contention. So we guarantee that you will get uh, workload isolation so that you're not in a situation where those resources are conflicting. So you kind of bring in the performance of Cassandra with the Hadoop analytics by the dropping in the NoSQL database. That's correct. The, it's the core of it, and then what we do is it gives you all the architectural advantages that people love about Cassandra, which is the fully distributed, gives you the continuous availability, no single points of failure, um, geographical distribution for multi-data centers. That all gets uh, inherited, if you will, into the Hadoop layer. So you sort of get that all for free when you're doing your MapReduce, your Hive, and, and your Pig. Okay, and you said before you don't fork the code. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that? What's your open source strategy? Right, so uh, just to be clear, when we talk about forking code, that's a situation where somebody would take a version and say, we're going to give the open source uh, world version A, but then we're going to take our own version and do all these special things to it to make it better. The reason that we don't adopt that as a business philosophy is because we want to see people come to us for the advantages inside of Datastax Enterprise. But if we cause unnatural development behavior in the open source world versus in Datastax Enterprise, it becomes a very tough transition path for an open source user to come, and we don't want that. So we want to see Cassandra grow and thrive and get better and stronger on its own. Our value then on top of that becomes the, the standard stuff, like supporting it, like um, web-based tools for monitoring and management of it, but then the real value to the businesses comes in Datastax Enterprise value add on top of what you could do with just Cassandra by itself. Scott, break down, the, uh, break down for the folks watching, obviously Cassandra, hot open source, uh, code base and, and community, um, very vibrant. You have Hadoop, which came out of the woodwork. That's growing really fast and right. it's being hyped up big time and, and legitimately, I mean, but it, there is seriously hype behind it. Oh, sure. Um, Talk about, <laughs> it's, it's, it's legit, I think. Um, talk about why Cassandra Hadoop, break it down for 
folks out there that are actually in doing real business because they're existing with legacy stuff. They got data warehouses, they got business intelligence systems. Yep. So it's not they're not in the in crowd of the flavor of the month is going to be this or that <laughs> or the other thing. Right. They got to solve real problems. So talk about break down the whole open source opportunity relative to how you guys are adding value, Cassandra versus Hadoop, and how that gets applied into your into the marketplace. Sure. So you got to remember first of all you're talking to a 20-year relational guy. So I completely understand that when you're thinking about a business problem and you're considering abandoning a 30-year ecosystem, you better have a good reason. <laughs> like it better be a good business yeah. reason to do that. Yeah, you don't do it because you want to. You do it No, you do it because you have to, yeah. and you see some real advantages of that. And so when it comes to something like Cassandra, what people see is the first question I ask people when they're evaluating technologies and they come to me for advice, I'll ask them, how important is it for you for your application to always be available? And sometimes it's not. Sometimes you have a situation where downtime is completely acceptable. But when continuous availability is of paramount importance, that puts Cassandra on a very short list. And because of the architecture, it's enabling that to happen not only in a local data center, but across data centers. So you can do things like disaster avoidance. You can make sure that for performance reasons, your data is closer to your users. So. That is one aspect of it, but we can say, well, hang on, in a relational world, I have high availability, right? That's been around for a long time. But what you don't have is the ability to then scale that to levels that relational databases just weren't designed to handle. Moreover, now you're into this notion of the data being um, semi-structured and unstructured. What's that mean? Well, it means that you're going to have an unpredictable set of attributes yeah. for any given row. That creates a lot of flexibility for developers, but the relational world wasn't built on that concept. And then the last element is flat out scalability, but at a cost effective um, rate, so that you're not punishing yourselves on the cost side of the equation and then limiting yourself on the future growth side of the equation, but yet you're solving your mission critical problems. So, so those are the things that sort of. So there's always sort of like that. in the in the nuances of the communities of, of uh, the alpha geeks and all the all the people in the open source community. There's always mud being thrown between different open source projects. People promote and jockey, forking the code, all this other stuff you mentioned. Okay, let's take let's rise out of that and talk mm -hmm. about the real world about Cassandra and customers and, and and dealing with things like Cassandra and Hadoop. At the end of the day, people don't want to get stuck with anything, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want to get stuck with Hadoop. They don't want to get stuck with Cassandra. If it doesn't evolve fast enough right. with the market and the pace of the challenges, whether it's integrating the BI. What's the update on Cassandra? How has it changed? You mentioned your, your business model's changing a little bit with the market. What's changed with Cassandra relative to those customers? Not so much the, the sure. in industry infighting or conversations, but really at the customer level, what's changed with the, with the product and the community? Absolutely, so the, the first thing is the general education level. Our biggest, people ask me all the time, it's a very common and legitimate question, who are your competitors? Then you get into this, what I think is kind of silly mudslinging, um, where you're all fighting over this little patch of territory. Our real competitor is ignorance. And I don't mean that in the nefarious sense of the term, I mean literally just the ecosystem has to get educated and caught up on how do you think differently about these problems. And so what's happened in the last, I'd say six months in particular, with some of the customers that we brought on board, we have about, to give you a reference point, about 140, 150 customers. So when that happens, what we're starting to see now in Q4 are names of companies that my mom would recognize, right? Not just these edge case companies. And when I'm asking them, how did you hear about us? What is happening to, to change things? They're starting with prototypes and they're starting with small projects. And here's an interesting thing they're doing as well. They're actually starting with, if they have a large project with multi um, architectural aspects to it, they're replacing one piece of a very large application structure with something like Cassandra, and they're rolling it in slowly, and then they're making it more and more a part of the critical stack. And what we're seeing now, starting in Q4, and I'd say moving into this year, is people are now saying, okay, I'm through the prototype, now I've got some people who understand how to think in a new data model way. I got some people who understand what big data really is, and now that's moving from prototype into real production. That's the big difference I'm seeing. So let's drill on that point about the prototype production. Obviously it's a new mindset, but the solutions are new in the sense of predictive analytics and real-time analytics are on the forefront now. Um, but 
I was just talking with someone in the hallway prior uh, to me coming on with you, uh, and there's these new solutions coming out, but also, he's also a data warehouse business intelligence guy. So we've been talking about this stuff forever. Every session he's gone to, it's like, hey, I went to a conference you know, 10 years ago, same kinds of conversations, right. except the predictive and real-time piece is now bolted on the front of it. So question on that is, are those things happening? What kinds of conversations are new, and which ones are the same old conversations? The, the conversations that are new, are around the cost-effective and manageable scale. That's what's new, because when you think about those two things together, cost-effectiveness and manageability, right, those often are at odds. You will pay for simplicity, or conversely, you will sacrifice um, simplicity for cost. So if you want to save money, you'll do that. In this new world, it's about trying to balance all of those things together and doing it in a way that is going to also give you this flexibility. This notion of the application developer not being tied to a rigid schema is actually a really big deal. I was a developer for a long time. And so to be freed from that rigid schema creates some good things, but it also creates some bad things because now you're losing the discipline sometimes of people who really understand how to document the data and how to tell other people about what's in the system. We used to have these folks called data architects and people who did all this management. In this new world, that's going to have to take some time to catch up. So I'd say some of those so are some of the So Bill Smarjo from EMC, obviously, has been on the data warehouse business intelligence uh, side of the house for many, many years. He's now at EMC. He said that architecturally, the data model is no longer the lock-in. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I, partially. I think there's other aspects to it, but that is that is correct. And the way I describe it to people who maybe aren't familiar with data models, I say imagine uh, that you're building your house and your house has these things called load-bearing walls, right? So when those three things get fixed and you want to make a change to your house, it becomes a very big project. You can't just simply say, I like to move all the rooms and reorganize all the rooms. That is analogous to a relational database schema. It's fixed, it's rigid, it, it's defined, and good things come with that. In this world, where you have this so-called NoSQL, and I think flexible schema is a better way to say it, but in this world, you can literally wake up every day and say, I want every room in my house to be different. And you can do it like that. And that's the difference between thinking about a rigid schema versus a flexible schema. It's a very different way of thinking about things. So let me ask you about some other trends that are, I'd like to get your opinion on. Um, one, obviously we had Scott Detson, who's uh, with Pure Storage, did WebLogic, he's an old time systems guy. Um, the, the comeback of the systems architecture, the reconfiguration as one trend um, that I want you to comment on in terms of the, this new solution set around this data, data stuff. Two, Flash obviously changing some of the database architectures around latency. Mm -hmm. um, and three, the rise of HBase. So just comment on those three things if you can. Uh, are we coming back to a, a systems architecture, programming model that's new, um, and uh, what do you think so about that? So it's funny, the, the, and Flash uh, and then, uh, it's uh, interesting, the, the older that you are, that you've been in this industry for a long time, you start <laughs> like to us. see these things, yeah, <laughs> and you start to go, this sounds awfully familiar, yeah. right? <laughs> this yeah, is, is are we talking about an IMS database? Yeah. Like for people who've been around a long time when they hear these things, and so it, it is definitely um, reinventing some of the same stuff, but I'd look at it not as a circle, but maybe more as a spiral where, yeah, it sort of like looks familiar territory, but you've actually moved a little closer to the target, and the target comes around again, that cost, that flexibility, that scalability, that manageability, things that before were awfully difficult to do. But yes, some of the paradigms are going to look very familiar as you're on that spiral. You're, I've seen that before, I've seen that story before. Um, so that's, that's one aspect Things are being unbundled. Like look at when you're talking to a bunch of folks with Flash, they're essentially taking commodity servers and creating master-slave architecture with Flash, high performance, mm -hmm. completely changing. And this is not just for unstructured, this is for like, yes. you know, combination of both. I mean, Absolutely, so that that's the second up? point. The, 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 we saw this coming a long time ago, even at my old role at Quest. We saw this, you know, like everybody, five years ago, saying it's just a cost equation now. Clearly the technology is what everybody wants. They want that speed, there's a lot of value to it, but it was unreliable for a long time and then it was very expensive. It seems like we've hit that tipping point with Flash, where now that's becoming a standard. So I actually was talking to uh, somebody who's very educated in this space, does a lot of research for one of the big hardware companies. David Floyer. And, uh, <laughs> no, and I was asking him about the trends, and he said, I think that spinning media will definitely have its place, and it will probably still always be a larger percentage of the market, but it's all about the use case. If performance was my holdup, I'm going to move to Flash. If 
cost was my holdup, I'm going to go to these cheaper and cheaper and cheaper spinning disks. So it is impacting the market in a way, but I think it's going to be a selective choice. It won't be carte blanche. I think it'll be a, a hybrid solution based on the use case and your, and your checkbook, quite frankly. Okay, then the third thing, and then I know Dave wants to jump in on some of those questions of Flash, because I can see him chomp at the bit. Uh, HBase, the rise of HBase has been very popular. Yeah, so I think that it's really synonymous with HBase, the problem was, okay, I've got this data in Hadoop, and I want to do these batch analytics against it, and but I also now want to start getting at it real time. Um, if you think about that scenario, it's, it's the same outcome, but in a different order than how Cassandra typically would get introduced into the equation. Cassandra begins with the real time side, and then with Datastax Enterprise, we want to introduce the Hadoop capabilities on top of it. So HBase is really a natural step if you think about it in terms of low latency data requests. I have to get at it, so I need a way to do that. And if you're going to use it on top of HDFS, then that's HBase. If you have a different model where you're looking at something like Cassandra or React or or Mongo, or even something like Membase. Um, these are all different implementations, but the use cases are, and this is I think the point you're hitting on, it might be better to say, what's going on with the rise of real-time big data? Because what we're seeing, and I don't mean scientific real-time, you get into these debates, is it yeah, yeah. I mean quasi real-time, yeah, near yeah. real-time. Yeah. Um, Fast. Fast, <laughs> velocity, velocity and variety, whereas Hadoop, volume. These other things are velocity and variety. What other so things? You mean like uh, Mongo? Yeah, Cassandra, Mongo, HBase, yeah. Reoc, all, all those other systems. So I think that's a distinction that's definitely emerging. People are waking up to the real-time transactional side of big data, not just the uh, batch analytics side. I, I wanted to talk about that. That was actually one of my questions. I, I would love to talk about Flash too, but I think this is actually more interesting and, and more in context. Real-time, uh, you're right. There are a lot of academic debates about it. Uh, the, the best definition I ever heard was from David Flory. He said, real time is uh, fast enough so that you don't lose the customer. Right. You're going to act before you lose the customer I love or that. the yeah. patient. I mean, that, that's kind of not academic real, real time. Do you buy that? Is that I, a fair definition? I, yeah, I absolutely do. I try and tell people it's more about query response. So if I'm writing a query and I'm expecting a response back, to me, that for most business people, that's real time as opposed to I fire off a query, I fire off a job, I go to lunch, I go home, I come back, there's my, that's batch. Okay. So, and then as you say, the use case, I, I, I actually like that definition. I think that's very good because it puts mm -hmm. a, a use case face on this. And this is what we're struggling with in this world is use cases. People like can only hear so much about the technology and the architectures and then they want to understand, tell me, is this going to help me run my business? And so thinking about it, yeah, before you lose the customer or like your patient, that's an extreme example, but um, that's, that's thinking about real time in the right way, I think, for yeah. a business person. Yeah, good, I agree. Um, and then my second question is an organizational one. You're a former DBA, you've you know, risen up, obviously great career, but you know, started in the trenches. Good time to be a DBA or not? You know, you hear all about data scientists and new skill sets. What's, uh, what's your thought on that and what's your advice to DBAs? So this is a question that's near and dear to my heart because A, yeah, I came from that world and B, I have a lot of friends who are still in that world and C, I spent the last 10 my, years of my career developing tools for that world. So um, I think there is a phenomenal opportunity for DBAs and here's why. Um, just like we were talking about a second ago, a lot of times we've seen this show before. We've seen how this stuff evolves. What's happened in this world is because this has been such a developer and operation centric movement, the DBAs have not had a seat at the table. Developers love to develop. I, I was one, right? Developers don't like to do maintenance. They don't like to babysit. They don't like something when it gets old. There's going to have to be somebody to step into that equation who can sit there over top of this and guess what it's called? You're administering a database. These things are still databases. They're not relational databases, they're still databases. Mm -hmm. So I believe there's a real role for somebody who can understand the data, understand the value of the data, understand how the app team works with the operations team. And I think the people with the most institutional knowledge are the DBAs. So if they're willing to step out of their comfort zone and start educating themselves on this, I think they have a very strategic role to play. If nothing else, how do you decide? How do you decide if I need a relational system or a, no or a NoSQL? Wouldn't it be nice to go to your 15 year DBA and say, hey, you're a senior fellow, you've been around here a long time, can you help us understand the difference? 
I think there's a powerful, powerful place for the DBA. Yeah, so the DBAs obviously have a lot of influence in a relatively narrow sphere. You're talking about widening that into Absolutely. a more strategic role. So Absolutely. Uh, good time to be a DBA. You heard it from Billy Bosworth on the Cube. <laughs> All right, it's break time. Uh, Billy, thanks very much for coming on. It was great to have you. Thanks, guys. Good to meet you. Okay. Uh, great to appreciate you. Uh, thanks. Data Your, stacks uh, growing. Support, yeah. Cassandra, very popular. 140 customers. Congratulations! I tweeted that out since you said it. So. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sure yeah, we didn't really get into customers, Private but company, you, the you great know. listener, Netflix. I know is a customer, and yeah. there's a zillion. You want to share your revenues while we're at it? Yeah. Uh, I will hold that uh, one for a later show. Count? I'll Let's wait see. for the IPO. How about, how about headcount? What's that? Head I'll count? wait for the IPO. We're uh, about 45. Okay. okay, we'll okay. crunch the expense numbers and back into the revenue number. <laughs> okay, thanks. So Jeff Kelly will have that on his next report. Thanks for coming on the Cube.